Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at thechangeleader.com. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Thank you, David. Our special guest today is Dr. Tom Mars, the Assistant Director of Texas A&M Center for Executive Development. Tom has spent 14 years at A&M as a faculty member, employee training and development specialist, and in a clinical role as a psychologist at the Employee Assistance Program, where he provides counseling and consultation services to over 10,000 Texas A&M employees and their dependents. Tom has also served as the National Olympic Development Team coach for 14 years through the U.S. Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And he himself is a two-time world champion and five-time All-American team member in shooting. Dr. Mars is an expert on workplace behaviors, motivation, communications, stress management, conflict, and interpersonal aspects of management. And he's here to talk with us about how our higher ed is nearing burnout in dealing with the COVID crisis and what university presidents can do going forward to ensure their institutions remain viable and their employees and faculty healthy and resilient. Tom, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here. Oh, I'm looking forward to this. It's great to have you on the show as well, especially because there hasn't been a whole lot written about the issues, the, the stress that faculty and employees are going through. I mean, it's, it's focused a lot on students and rightly so, but you've got the other side of the equation and this has been going on for, for six months continuous now. Yes, it, it, it certainly has. And the stress from this has continued throughout that time to accumulate. I think rather than adapting to this, as things change, the stress level has gotten continuously higher as we've seen the, the effects of this. There's so much going on right now in the world from people's isolation and the problems that come with that to uh, the fear of illness and death from the pandemic to the financial stress, political unrest, social discord, the overall lack of resources we realize now that we have and then the increased work demands uh, as well. This is, is all really starting to develop into a, a, a sort of a bottleneck of all those, all those stressors. Yeah. As, as one of my wife's favorite HGTV programs says, man, we got a hot mess here. Yeah, indeed we do. We, we certainly do. One that no one could have predicted uh, would have gone this way, I think. It's like one of my previous guests, uh, Gordon Gee, who's the president of West Virginia University, said, this pandemic is accelerating needed changes in higher ed by a decade or more. And, and we're, we're seeing that in so many different ways. The problem is the stress gets put on people. And after doing all of these things for six months, if not longer, people are tired. They are. And, you know, in any situation where you have continued stress for this long of a period of time, particularly from the unknowns in this, the open-ended nature of this, if, if something is stressful, but it has a, a known end to it, like a natural disaster, that is very stressful, but you know you'll rebuild You'll fix things. The weather will come right again, and you will recover from it. The problem with this pandemic is it is it's so open ended. We don't necessarily see the light at the end of the tunnel. With that, human beings have, have a a low tolerance for ambiguity. What I what I call it. Uh, we don't like not knowing what's going to happen and when it's going to happen, and that in and of itself is stressful. Well, if if we know what's going to happen. That's one thing. But this is silent. It's invisible. And we never know when it's going to happen, if it's going to happen. And that puts a whole nother level of complexity and stress on an already stressful situation. It does. And, you know, more than anything, it's the 
the confluence of all of those different stressors loading onto this at the same time. You know, I think about where universities, colleges and universities in the United States are right now, the things that they're having to deal with that we would not have been able to predict. I think about from an administrative standpoint, the liabilities that have been brought into the equation from trying to conduct business in a world with a pandemic and the hard decisions that have to be made that affect lives of the students, the staff, the faculty, and the economies. Because so many schools, their influence on the economies in their communities is so large that that's another factor that plays into the decision-making process. And that's a lot of stress. It, it is. I mean, you're, you're there at A&M, and A&M is the single largest employer in College Station, Texas. Yes. Yes, without a doubt. And there are many other schools like us, but the economy here is in large part based on tourism, on the student population that's here, from sporting events, um, from the research that we do that brings people in, economic development, it all very much uh, has a, a linchpin of the university. So that's a lot hanging in the balance for the administrators. And it's that way at many universities. This is, this is a challenge because if it's been stressful for a long period of time, and as we talked about before, this long time stress you know, faculty, employees going through all of these things, it, it puts people into survival mode, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. Um, and that's a natural reaction, Drum. I think when, when someone is under duress for that long, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy, right, you are, we become very task focused when you put us under stress for a long period of time. We're just trying to get things done and we hyper-focus on what task can I take care of right now in this moment. There's no room for higher order thinking and thinking about where are we going uh, in the big picture, and the direction of our department or of the university. We get into that survival mode and get myopic about surviving. And that's what Maslow told us. The lower you go, the more focused you become on basic fundamental survival. But the problem with that is over a long period of time, you start to see burnout. And uh, another famous bit of research was on performance at different levels of stress called the yerkes dodson performance curve. And what it basically says is people don't perform really well with no stress or with very high stress. But it's that sweet spot in the middle uh, when things are happening that you do your best. We are fully into the tail of that curve with high stress, and we're seeing it in behaviors in the workplace, performance from our employees, uh, the decision-making that is going on right now, I think, is, is showing signs of that stress and burnout. Yeah. Well, you had mentioned when we spoke before about how people decompensate through right. this whole period. What, what did you mean by that? Well, all human beings have a compensatory mechanism that we can handle stress that comes in. If you think about stress simplified, it's demands placed on the organism. And those demands can be uh, physical, psychological, or emotional. And we all have sort of, um, if you think about it like RAM memory in a computer, we have a set amount of, of RAM you know, with which to deal with demands. But if you exceed that that level that you're capable of handling, what happens in a computer when you exceed the RAM memory? It starts to run slowly. Yeah. Or, or locks up. It locks up. It crashes. When you get, you know, six windows open and a Zoom call and all of these things happening, um, you're dealing with finances, um, watching the news, which I don't recommend, <laughs> Uh, hurricanes in Texas right now and weather events uh, back to back, um, you know, the election coming, all of these things, they start to shut down. So we can compensate for those stressors up to a point. But when we reach that maximum threshold of what we have the resources 
available to deal with, we start to decompensate. And what that looks like is people start uh, showing burnout, but they develop stress behaviors um, like a low frustration tolerance. Things trigger you very easily and you get very frustrated, develop sort of a hair trigger on your irritation mechanism, as it were. <laughs> Is that what they mean by going postal? Uh, 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 yes. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> well, you know, and that's another thing with the postal service now about to be closed down. It's unfortunately may breed new life into that phrase. I hope not. Yeah, or or it may die, you know, in a couple of years with no postal service. People may not even know what that means. <laughs> it's a common vernacular now. But people will develop a tall antenna for picking up on negativity when they get stressed. They become more rigid. All the things you think about of people being stressed out, uh, very inflexible, um, on edge, they look for potential threats in the environment. If anyone is causing them problems, they are seen as troublemakers and people don't have tolerance for that. So I, I have personally seen with a lot of our clients here at the Center for Executive Development reporting more difficult behaviors in the workplace, more infighting and team problems, problems between uh, leadership and team members. As patience starts to wane, you know, another thing that I've also noted within our own team is forgetfulness. When you start to get stressed out, somebody on the, my team said, you know, I swear since this pandemic started, I've lost 20 IQ points. <laughs> Sometimes I'll just sit at my computer and I know what I'm supposed to do, but I, I can't remember how to do it. I'll just sit and stare at the computer. And that's that's the direct result of being stressed out. Here, I thought it was just the natural, you know, getting older and, and what I call CRS. Can't remember squat. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to deny there may, there may be some of that as well, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I cannot confirm or deny that drum. Um <laughs> Well, it's been great but, having you on the show, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Is that one of those rigid behaviors or the antenna being up? That's <laughs> self-protection, yes. Oh, okay. At its, at its best. <laughs> so we're, we're seeing a lot of really, you know, funky behaviors coming out of people. Yeah, yes, absolutely. That are predictable. Again, anytime that there's this much uncertainty and this much stress. But the, the real question, of course, is what do we do with that? And what impact does that have on leadership in our schools? You know, so what do we do? You, what, what do we advise university presidents and, you know, leaders in universities? They've been under stress for a long time. So, you know, what can they do? Well, you know, I think we have to look at it in context. We're very focused right now, and we need to acknowledge that. On the students. They are a protected population, right? So they are our reason for being, right? But what are we doing to help each other, the faculty and the staff, in the process of that? The students have the Student Counseling Center, which, as an aside, this generation has seen a great, much greater utilization of, of counseling services on campus. There was a report that came out. Um, it's been probably 15 years ago that I read this towards the tail end of the millennial generation that said because of destigmatizing mental health, the expectation now when a student comes to school is that they will have counseling available for them and that they will be able to use it. And we have seen roughly a 300% increase in service utilizations at college campus counseling centers. So we know that that exists and we're, we're there and we're helping with that. But what are we doing to protect our faculty and our staff as part of that? So being able to step back and go, okay, yes, we have an obligation to take care of the students, certainly, and make decisions that are geared towards the safety and security of our students but what are we missing in the process? What opportunities are we missing to take care of faculty and staff? 
So just paying attention to that, looking at what options we have, I think is a critical first step. And I suspect there's no easy answers with any of these things. No, because, you know, when we, uh, most people's reaction to that, if I say that, is that's great, Tom. Well, where are we going to get the resources to do that? We already mm-hmm. have budget cutbacks. We're having to lay people off. You know, when we get to the place where we're laying faculty off, that's not a stable enough situation where we can expend funds on, you know, any big programs to try to help faculty staff. But where we can, where we can make a difference is watching people's uh, function and and how they're uh, doing, how they're they're existing in the workplace and having empathy, being aware of stress, um, monitoring expectations. As we get under more stress, the people that are closest to us usually bear the brunt of that, right? So if I'm stressed out as an administrator, that's going to roll downhill. I'm going to expect more from the people under me and demand more from them with no awareness of how they're functioning, where their stress level is. People haven't taken vacations over the entire summer. They have child care issues. They have health issues. Um, there's so many things that load onto that. So can we step back and just develop a little bit of understanding and empathy. I think that is that is critical, and that's an easy thing to do if you're aware of it. Mm-hmm. And I think the term that comes to mind for me is grace. Absolutely. Developing a little bit of grace and working with other people right now is absolutely critical. And that same, those same behaviors, this emotional intelligence, not only does it have to be applied to others, we need to apply that to ourselves as well. We do. We have to pay attention. Um, that's another thing that I think is critical to be able to deal with this is paying attention to where we're at, recognizing how we are doing. Are we being very reactive to things? And that's part of emotional intelligence, right? Most MBA programs in the United States now teach emotional intelligence because it brings tangible results. It's no longer considered a soft skill. And where that really becomes critical is under periods of stress and uncertainty. So having self-awareness and awareness of others and being able to control your reactions to things and reactions to others probably makes more of a difference than any other thing we can do. And the best part is that's free. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's amazing how everything seems to have a price tag on it, isn't it? (laughs) Desperate times call for desperate measures, I guess. (laughs) Exactly. And big, big checkbooks. Yes, (laughs) absolutely. Yeah, getting getting back to something a little more serious than money. Some of the things we, when we talked about this before, it was like people need to talk. They need to be able to break the silence and the stigma around burnout. I mean, everybody's facing burnout at this point. There was an article in Ed Surge, you know, they're saying there's a burnout pandemic. Faculty, staff are tired, and the fall semester hasn't even started yet. So we got to take these things into account. Sure. And and this is one of those things where it, it's very predictable, at least with my psychologist hat on, it's predictable um, because we are experiencing so much change. And human beings are not wired to be able to handle this much change this quickly. So when we have to change so many things and learn new processes, and I mean, how many schools have had to take their entire course catalog and put it online. Mm -hmm. And the demands that has placed on faculty and staff in the last five or six months has just been absolutely tremendous. So being able to recognize people are doing the best they can, um, monitor expectations, have grace where, where you can for people and how they're performing, and 
cut them some slack. Yeah. You know, that's embrace some flexibility, you know, simplify, you know, you don't need to be rolling out all these new programs right now. Right. Yeah. I, I would certainly say that as again, as uh, we're, we're trying to deal with this, many people will react by becoming extremely task focused in order to feel a sense of control, right? Mm-hmm. One is to feel like I'm in control of my environment. I don't like feeling out of control. So I'm going to look for things that I can do that will help me feel more in control. And if that is this problem right here, I, I'm going to fix that because I can feel like I'm doing something. So I put a team together and I roll out a, a new program or a new standard operating procedure or whatever it is. It makes you feel better temporarily, but it adds to the stress level incredibly. And knowing that, you know, we, we teach a, a program here at Texas A&M. It's called uh, the Leadership Command College, uh, LEMIT, Law Enforcement Management Institute of Texas. And one of the things that we discuss with the law enforcement uh, that comes here is that when you are tired you're physically tired, you tend to make good decisions, but very slowly. It takes you more time to make a decision. When you are stressed out, you make terrible decisions with a great deal of speed. So think about that under the current circumstances before making any rash decisions, before reorganizing departments, rolling out new programs, that sort of thing, that 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 exists. Mm -hmm. That makes great sense. Now, one of the challenges that I see is you've got the entire university under significant stress. You've got the leadership under stress, and you've got students under stress. That's not a good formula, is it? No, unfortunately, um, it, it certainly isn't. You know, the, the entire planet, I think, is is under stress. But again, we have a charge that the students come first. But what you see is a focus on student needs and ignoring what we need for ourselves and what those around us on our team need, but being aware that with that many people in one place with this much stress, you start to see bad behaviors. Mm-hmm. And being aware of what those behaviors are, what they're going to be predictably, and what to do with them. And, and we could have an entire discussion uh, just based on managing difficult behaviors and stress behaviors, but it starts with that emotional intelligence and awareness of what you're reacting to. We used to have a saying years ago, if you need to take a mental health day, take a mental health day. And I would strongly recommend folks, if you need a day off, take it, leave your phone. There is nothing, virtually nothing that can't wait 24 hours to be done. That's true. And, you know, something that we've seen with generational differences, millennials and certainly Gen Z really struggle with that because the, they don't have the same boundaries between work life and home life. So they may come in late to work, want to come in at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock, but they are just as likely to be up at 10 o'clock at night answering emails while they lie in bed. And so that has become normalized with all generations in the workplace so that it's expected. And that's really starting to become a bigger problem now with the pandemic and the lack of boundaries that exist when people are working from home. When you're at home, you're in your office now. Many people, I think, at the beginning of this pandemic thought, oh man, everybody working from home, they're not going to get anything done. They're going to be sitting on the couch, watching TV, waking up late. And what we're actually seeing is quite the opposite. There's fewer boundaries, and so they're working more hours without that differentiation of work life and home life. 
So be careful of if someone takes a day off, not emailing them or texting them saying, oh, just when you get back to work, answer this. Or if you could do this when you get back, because the draw is going to be for them to not take the day off, not take a break, but rather respond. And that does us a terrible disservice. We've become so habitualized in answering emails, text messages, all of those things, that when we are supposed to be spending time with our family, our our device, you know, the, the that crazy phone that we've got, it's there with us always, whether, you know, we're playing solitaire on it or answering text messages from colleagues. We have to put it down. Absolutely. And and that is uh that's very difficult for many of us, again, to, to put my psychologist hat on for a moment, uh, when they have done studies with functional MRIs, uh, looking at parts of the brain that light up when a person addicted to drugs uses that drug, or a person with a gambling addiction places a bet, when they look at people using their cell phones, they're denied use of their cell phone for a given period of time, and you actually can see behaviors that mimic true addiction. And when they get on their phone and they can start using their phone, the same parts of the brain light up as someone who is addicted. So being aware of that and the higher the stress level, the more they're going to rely on that. Absolutely. It's one of those crazy things that if they're, people become aware of it, they say the first step for any kind of addiction is recognizing you have a problem. Well, people are addicted to their phones. They're addicted to work and sure. with no boundaries. I mean, I've worked in a home office now for 20 plus years. And there was a point in time where I had to say at such and such a time in the evening, I'm out spending time with family and that's it. Right. I think that's critical for our administrators, but also for their understanding of the people that work for them. So there's good communication there. They can be aware of that and understand that that is your part in this of what you can do to relieve some of the effects of the stress from this situation. That makes great sense. Tom, I'd love to keep talking. We're getting toward the end of our time. Three takeaways for university presidents on how to deal with this burnout, how to deal with their employees through this this crazy time we live in? Wow. I, I think first would be to take care of yourself. You're of no use to anyone if you're stressed out and are far on the end of uh, that performance curve, uh, not doing your best work, making making decisions from a position of, of stress and fear of the repercussions. So take care of yourself. Use stress management tools. Take a day if you need it. I think the second point would be having empathy for others, being very aware of your emotional intelligence and your engagement, uh, monitoring the level of engagement from the people under you and their burnout and try to compensate for that by giving them time off or doing what you can. And then third, I think um, remembering to, this is not the time to make a lot of unnecessary decisions. You need a sounding board. Um, When in doubt, consult, consult, consult is what I've always been taught in psychology. And I think that that certainly applies here. So have a sounding board, rely on others, and be careful of of decision-making process. That's great advice for presidents. Thank you. So what's next for you, the center? Well, we are, like most universities, we have pivoted very quickly, more quickly than we ever imagined possible. I've become an expert now in online learning modalities that six months ago I knew nothing about. And it's amazing to see the technology that has been developed in the last six months alone uh, with lightning speed. It's remarkable. So we are converting many of our courses over to uh, a virtual environment. Um, and we're also developing new and novel ways to do face-to-face programs as well with the pandemic and process. So we're, we're very focused on that. <laughs> 
and, and surviving. Thriving and surviving. Thriving and surviving. That's it. Tom, thank you so much for being on the show. This has been some great advice for, for some presidents. Look forward to having you back on the show again sometime in the future. Tom, I appreciate it very much. My pleasure. Take care, my friend. Thanks for listening this week. And a special thank you to this week's special guest, Dr. Tom Mars, and for his sharing his thoughts on what university presidents can do to build employee and faculty resiliency to weather the COVID storm. Our next guest is Dr. Sam Horn, president of the Masters University and Seminary. Sam recently became TMUS's ninth president, succeeding Dr. John MacArthur, and he'll be joining us to talk about the first 100 days of a presidency and how that has changed due to the COVID pandemic. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, a consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic, along with show notes on this episode at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show. and We would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton, post-production by David L. White.